everyone. Welcome back to part three of my three-part series on dogs with splenic masses and hemangiosarcoma. In part one, we talked about all dogs with splenic masses, uh, including some of the other masses in the spleen. The big take-home tip there was it is not always hemangiosarcoma. In part two, we talked about symptoms with dogs with splenic masses, including hemangiosarcoma, and we talked about the tests that you should definitely do and some of the tests that you can skip before you go to surgery. But in this part, in part three, we are talking about treatment. So if you remember in one of the earlier videos, I talked about there's two battlefronts for this cancer, and that's how I think about treating it. So the first battlefront is the spleen, is the tumor growing in the spleen. To deal with that is typically gonna be surgery, and that surgery is called splenectomy. Unfortunately, that is not curative because this cancer has such a high spread rate, so the cancer is still going to metastasize or spread. It doesn't mean don't do surgery. You just need to have realistic expectations, and that's hopefully why you're watching this video to get the information. So in general, with surgery, you get about one to three months, but you're removing the spleen, you're removing the source of bleeding. And so I consider that a palliative treatment option. So it's still a good treatment option, but I want you to know statistically what you're likely to get. It's important to know with statistics, when I give you these numbers, does that mean your dog is only gonna live one to three months? No, there are dogs that live six months or longer with hemangiosarcoma and just removing the spleen. And there are dogs that may only live shorter. So there's always gonna be range, but we're gonna give you the statistics and always hope for the best and hope that your dog is a statistics buster. We talked about in extensively in the last part that you know, in a lot of ways, surgery is also a diagnostic because that's gonna provide us the opportunity to find out what the tumor is. When your veterinarian or the surgeon's in there, they are going to explore the entire abdomen. They're gonna be looking for any suspicious suspicious lesions in other organs or something called the omentum. Things change, you know, and recommendations will change over time. So when I was a resident in 2001 to 2003, at that point, the recommendation was to take a biopsy of the normal liver to look for micro metastasis. Things change. At this point, it's only recommended to take a biopsy of the liver if there's a suspicious lesion. So you definitely want the veterinarian or the surgeon to look at all the different lobes of the liver, but we're not recommending at this point to take a liver biopsy of a normal looking liver. Your surgeon's gonna change gloves and instruments after they touch the contaminated cancerous uh, organ. They take out the spleen. They're gonna explore the entire abdomen and they lavage it out. So they're gonna wash everything out. Uh, we always say the solution to pollution is dilution. So, and remember, and I talked about this in part one, even at surgery, we cannot diagnose if there's masses in the liver, whether they're benign or if they're malignant, something called hyperplasia, hemangioma. So again, we wanna get our biopsies if there's lesions in other organs and then wait for the biopsies to come back. Surgery is palliative, um, but it does increase, the survival times after surgery are about one to three months. So really, to extend survival time after surgery, we need to fight that systemic battlefront, so to delay the cancer from metastasizing or spreading. And the standard of care has been chemotherapy, um, and it's been said that it doubles to triples survival times. But again, one year survival rates are very low at about less than 10%. It's thought that those that make it to the one year anniversary, which is phenomenal for this cancer, they are likely to survive long term. So when do we wanna start chemotherapy after surgery? Typically, we're gonna start about 10 to 14 days, so about two weeks after surgery. That's gonna give us enough time for the, the incision to heal, so they have a, what's called a ventral midline, usually down here, ventral midline incision to heal and the staples or the skin sutures will come out. Typically, we'll take them out at that first appointment when we're going to start chemotherapy. Again, the goal of chemotherapy is to delay metastasis, delay the cancer from spreading. Again, most commonplace is lungs and liver. 
So I have plenty of other resources for you, plenty of other videos about how well tolerated chemo is. So please check out the myths and misconceptions about chemotherapy. Check out the chemotherapy safety. I have a whole playlist. Uh, please check out the video, Your Pet Has Cancer, Now What? That will kind of give you an overview on where to go when you're looking for information. Also on where to find um, more information on my website, my chemotherapy information sheets and things like that. So let's stay focused on hemangiosarcoma. So the most commonly used intravenous drug is called doxorubicin. We're gonna start two weeks after surgery and give that for about six treatments uh, about every three weeks apart. There are some other chemotherapy drugs that have been shown to be effective. Um, cyclophosphamide, um, orally might be included in your protocol. Ifosfamide, epirubicin. There's some studies recently um, at one of my meetings that was mentioned that Colorado State is looking at carboplatin, so still some new information. And guys, you have to remember, this is an ever-evolving field. There will be studies coming out, so information will be changing. There's something called a DAVE protocol out there that's doxorubicin with DTIC and vincristine. I don't specifically use that, but again, that is one of the protocols out there. Um, one thing that I'd like to bring up is something called metronomic low-dose oral chemo. And on my list of videos to make, so hopefully I'll be making that shortly and then we can put a link to check that out because it's a really interesting idea and that's where you're giving continuous low doses of oral chemotherapy that you're administering at home under the care of your veterinarian or your oncologist. And it has this anti-angiogenesis, this anti-blood vessel effect. Um, and is often considered to be less toxic and depending on what drugs we're using can be less expensive. And there were some small studies that initially showed that this was comparable to giving intravenous doxorubicin, uh, but more recently the studies have kind of been a little bit all over the place. Um, so some studies showing that there hasn't been benefit. So not my, my, my go-to recommendation, but be on the lookout for more information. And I do think it's exciting that there have been some studies in Italy and overseas as well looking into that. But at this point, intravenous doxorubicin is gonna, going to be what I'm going to recommend when a family comes into me and you know we talk about what's going to be the, the chemotherapy that I'm recommending after splenectomy for their dog with hemangiosarcoma with no meds that we did on chest x-rays before surgery. Check out part two for that part. All right, so a couple other things that I wanna to touch on for, um, for treatment. So let's talk a little bit about supplements because there are some really interesting supplements out there. Um, and I also wanna talk about EBAT. Um, it's an engineered toxin that targets certain cells um, that are found in hemangiosarcoma. It's been shown to be safe and effective um, in extending survival times in dogs with hemangiosarcoma, both as a treatment and a chemo preventative. So for dogs that are at high risk for hemangiosarcoma. So that's really, really exciting. Again, very interesting, study still ongoing. I would encourage you to go to the University of Minnesota website and check out their Shine On study for more information. EBAT um, is exciting, but not yet available. So it's always like really, you're like, oh, this is really, really cool. But at you know, the time of this, uh, it's just not available to medical oncologists or veterinarians or to your pet yet. Uh, I would love to, you know, get my paws on this and see how we're gonna be able to integrate this into our treatment protocols. Will we combine it with chemotherapy? I, we don't know yet. Some of the other studies that have been uh, going on recently include Losartan. This is a common blood pressure medication. Uh, it's an angiotensin II blocker in dogs, um, and it seems to um, potentially have an effect. There is a study that's been going on at the Animal Medical Center in New York City where I did my residency, a placebo double-blinded study, which is really cool. So we'll see if that has efficacy. Another interesting study that's going on that you may have heard of when you've done some Googling potentially, and you, you know, I have mixed feelings about Googling for information, is propran propranolol, uh, which is a beta blocker that's used to treat high blood pressure, um, also sometimes migraines, which is something that I suffer from. Um, so they're looking at that as well. 
So let's shift gears and talk about supplements. So these are gonna be non-chemotherapy things, and there's a couple of really interesting ones, and the ones that uh, have got a lot of press uh, probably around 2012, 2013, are the polysaccharopeptide mushrooms, or PSP mushrooms. So these are not mushrooms that you're just picking up at your supermarket, but these are Asian mixtures of mushrooms. They're proprietary blends, and that's the hard part when you're trying to compare the different brands out there. But they have some really interesting mechanisms of action that really um, affect immune function. Uh, they cause cell cycle arrest of the cancer cells, potentially natural killer cell activity, increase apoptosis, this um, cell suicide that cancer cells evade. So there's some really interesting functions that these Asian mu mushrooms um, mixtures can potentially increase in our cancer cells. And the reason that this got a lot of press is there was a very small study that was done out of Penn that was published in 2012 by Dr. Brown. Where they, it was really small though, they only looked at 15 dogs and the 10 dogs that were in the two higher dosages of this mushroom with the I am Unity blend. So they had hemangiosarcoma, they had splenectomy, so they had surgery only. They did not have chemotherapy. Again, guys, 10 is really small when we're talking about statistical studies. You know, earlier I was talking about a study with 500 dogs and over 100 dogs. People studies, they often have thousands of people enrolled in these studies. But in the dogs, the second higher group, they lived four months. And in the highest group, uh, they lived six and a half months with no chemotherapy. So it got people really interested in these properties of these Asian mushrooms. Another one that I like that's a little less expensive is the Canine Immunity Plus. Guys, if you want to go back, please check out the video where I talk about the supplements that I use. I go into a little bit more detail of these. Um, but again, the eye immunity is the one that I recommend for mangiosarcoma. It's the one that they did the study. If it, it can get expensive, especially if you have a big dog, then I would use the canine immunity. Why do I recommend the eye immunity? That's the one that they did the study in. So it's, it's hard to know if you'll get the same sort of benefit with the other one. But I do think at least the canine immunity plus is better than nothing. So again, definitely check out, we'll put the link to my video on the different supplements there. Another interesting supplement to consider in dogs with hemangiosarcoma is a Chinese herbal supplement called Unimbio. Um, and this is a mixture of something called noto ginseng, it has a bunch of other interesting ingredients. The one that always jumps out as me is there's some ox bile in there, some Chinese yam. Uh, this is a supplement. Back when I was a resident, I used to have to send my, in New York City, I would send my clients down to Chinatown to get it. Now you can sometimes get it on Amazon, but sometimes it's on back order. Why would you think about even needing this for your dog with hemangiosarcoma? So it actually can help with bleeding issues. Uh, it's something that's used in people as well. Uh, they've used it in some small studies in people that were gonna have major jaw surgery where they were going to have bleeding. Um, North Vietnamese soldiers were had it in their packs and were told to take it when they were seriously bleeding. So it usually comes as pills, um, and then there's this red hit pill, and, and the soldiers were told to take that if they were seriously wounded. Um, the Chinese herbal patent formula recommends taking it for serious wounds with red wine. I don't recommend giving your dog red wine by any stretch of the imagination, but again, this is a human herbal supplement that, supplement that has been used in dogs uh, on a side note, I li really love it for dogs with nosebleeds, whether it's from nose tumors or high blood pressure or fungal infections. My husband is an internist and he uses it as well. I don't recommend this regularly for in general for dogs. And of course, guys, I'm not recommending specific recommendations. You need to take this information and talk to your veterinarian. I cannot make specific medical advice recommendations for your dog through the YouTube or Google or internet or anything like that. You need to take this information and talk to your veterinarian that has examined your dog, your cat, your pet. Unibio is an interesting supplement to use. Uh, it's an over-the-counter medication that you can use for bleeding. So for dogs, where I'm using it in my patients with mangiosarcomas, if they have 
bleeding. So um, maybe that dog that we've done splenectomy and later on in the course of disease, it spread to the liver and they have some, when they have a bleeding episode, we will use it then. So that is where I use it um, and I'm recommending it. I don't use it routinely throughout their, you know, through their chemotherapy protocol. Um, it is a Chinese supplement. Uh, it's, you know, there's always concerns about regulation and quality control uh, and things like that. So there are definitely things to consider and talk to your veterinarian, but I think it's uh, interesting, especially when they're having bleeding issues. Uh, it's something to, I tell my clients to have on hand for those dogs that have recurrent bleeding issues and have been personally impressed with some of its benefits. All right, guys, finally, we have made it to the end. Let's summarize. So without treatment, the prognosis is sadly poor. With surgery, typically the survival times are one to three months. And again, that's because it has such high metastatic rates. Uh, with the benefit, with the addition of chemotherapy, which we typically start at about two weeks after surgery, uh, we typically get about six months. Uh, some studies show about nine months if it didn't rupture. So dogs that have, did not have a hemoabdomen tend to do better than the dogs that have the ruptured mass because it's another uh, mechanism for those cancer cells to metastasize or spread. But the one-year survival rates are still really low, reported with splenectomy and doxorubicin-based chemotherapy to be about a year, and that's why the idea of whether metronomic chemotherapy and these supplements and things like that, I think are really interesting and worth trying, in my humble opinion. Some things that have been shown to have a better prognosis, so a non-ruptured mass, and a low-grade hemangiosarcoma on the biopsy report. So ask your veterinarian what grade was it when you got the biopsy back. If a dog has um, metastasis to the lungs, that have a worse prognosis. Um, if there's metastasis to the liver, again, they have a worse prognosis. So that definitely affects their outcome. Uh, I, def I have had dogs get to their one year anniversary, so it is definitely possible. There is reason to be hopeful, but it's a tough cancer and I'll be really excited when some of these new treatment options. Thank you so much for watching. I know this is a tough one. Um, I wish you all the luck in kicking cancer's butt. You know, tell me survival stories. I wanna hear about it. Leave them in the comments below. I hope you found this helpful. Please, if you did, subscribe. Check out the other videos. I think you'll find them helpful as well. Don't forget the chemotherapy playlist. Also, um, check out on Facebook. I often do live Q and A, so that's an opportunity to ask questions. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining, and I hope to see you at another video.